Our next panel today will focus on geopolitics. I would like to welcome to the stage Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and former U.S. National Security Advisor. Dr. Eyal Hulada, Senior International Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and former National Security Advisor of Israel. And joining us online, Ambassador Philippe Etienne, former French ambassador to the U.S. and diplomatic advisor to the president, and Lord Mark Sedwill, former national security advisor of the United Kingdom. Over to Ili Bayraktari, president and CEO of SESP, who will moderate this exciting conversation. Well, first I'm going to do some advertising about SESP. This is the report we published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's on the future of innovation, power, and generative AI. Please download it. Um, Gentlemen and uh, Lord Sedville and Ambassador Etienne, it's really an honor to be on stage with you and online. Um, you have had some of the toughest jobs that I can imagine in government, advising presidents and prime ministers on the state of uh, world geopolitics. Um, I was yesterday at your panel, General McMaster, uh, and one of the questions that strike me that I wanted to ask all of you is, given the political uncertainty, the security environment, the war in Ukraine, uh, Chinese aggression over Taiwan, um, do you, do you think today's environment reminds you more of the 1950s when we saw the beginning of the Cold War, or does it remind you of the 1930s? Um, Dr. Kissinger would argue that we are, uh, at the, you know, like this era of AI reminds him also at the beginning of the First World War. So if you would advise your old principles, what would be your advice? What does this era remind you of? Well, you know, as a historian, you, you have to say, and Kim Kagan's right there too, a fellow historian, you know, you, you can't say, hey, any, any period of time is exactly like this period of time, right? Because you want to you, you use history to help you ask the right questions, to, to think, uh, think in time, to think through comparisons, but not to be prescriptive. So I think it, it, it replicates and, and resembles a lot of different eras. I think pre-World War I is an, is an interesting period to look at because of the geostrategic and geopolitical dynamics as they affect the Eurasian landmass. And, uh, and there was a great essay written by a great historian, Margaret McMillan, uh, on the 100th anniversary of World War I uh, in 2014 called The Rhyme of History, which I highly recommend. But then other historian friends of mine, Yaku Griegel uh, and, and Wes Mitchell, have, have written a great book called Unquiet Frontier, in which they used the 1930s as, as an analogy. Um, I think those, those are both useful because I think what we're seeing now are revanchist and revisionist powers who are trying to gain a dominant position to create exclusionary areas of primacy, to create servile relationships with countries on what you might say is, is the, the rimland, to, to advance their vision for an altogether different kind of, of world, one that is, in, is biased in favor of authoritarian governance, uh, but also a status mercantilist economic model. And of course, I'm speaking about Russia and China and, and their agendas and you know the partnership that has no limits and so forth. Um, so I, I think that these historical analogies are useful to help you ask the right questions and, and maybe to, to maybe avoid the pitfalls of the past. And I think we'll probably talk a little bit uh, about that. You know, soon after I was fired as national security advisor, I had I had my my, my two friends, uh, Lord Sedwell and Ambassador Tien, over to my house for dinner, and uh, we were at Fort McNair and we walked around Fort McNair, you know, and. And we talked about the difficulties uh, in, in our relationships in the past, especially those with the United Kingdom. You know, Philippe <laughs> and I were kind of giving Lord Sedwell a, a tough time about it uh, because we we're, were, of course, looking down, uh, looking down the Potomac River at the White House that, you know, that the British burned in, in, in the War of 1812. <laughs> so, so what, <laughs> the idea was that, you know, these, these situations that exist in terms of geostrategic dynamics are not static. We can affect them. And so I'm quite optimistic, you know, about what we can achieve together with our dear allies who are represented here and with like-minded partners. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Hulata. Yeah, so first, uh, uh, thanks for having me here. I mean, I feel uh, uh, honored to be uh, with this group of, uh, uh, of great advisors. Um, and also maybe to pick up on history, you know, being Jewish, I always have an issue with resembling things to the 1930s. I think we need to be cognizant that at this point in time, uh, even with the problems we're experiencing in the world, I don't think there's a superpower envisioning that they want to militarily conquer the entire globe or with uh, uh, genocidal ideologies. Having said all that, uh, I think we are, uh, as HR um, explained, we are experiencing uh, polarization in magnitudes that resembles the darkest times of history. Uh, uh, you know, when I meet people here in, in, in Washington and ask them, 
uh, about polarization, not only globally, but also internally within the democracies. Uh, it resembles difficult times for all of all of our uh, uh, nations. And I think this is this is something that we need to, when we try to look back in history, uh, it seems as if the peoples uh, have forgotten what it looked like when we allowed authoritarian leaders to control the world. And what it looked like in the first uh, quarter of, of, of the last uh, uh, century, it, it brought the world into onto its knees and peoples were eliminated. Uh, th that does worry me. Um, and I think we need to be uh, uh, cognizant of that. But I don't think it's the 30s. There's th things to be done. Thank you. Uh, Lord Sedwell, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, good to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Maybe maybe next time. And uh, great to be on this uh, panel with old friends and colleagues. I really agree with that point. I don't. I think we've got to be careful about drawing any parallel in particular with the 1930s. HR is right. Your history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes and echoes as uh, as people have said. And I think the interesting comparison here is between the 1900s and the 1950s. The 1900s. There was essentially a challenge of power, of the German Empire, under an authoritarian leader seeking to um, uh, expand its influence at that stage um, with, through, the, through the colonial uh, system, uh, and challenging the, uh, essentially the incumbent, which was the British Empire at the time, with allies like the United States, and, and there were, you know, which was neutral. And let's not forget, we haven't talked about the non-aligned yet. Um, there's a third player and set of players in this. It's not just... The US and her allies and China and Russia, the authoritarian states, is very important as we saw in the G20. We have India and the new non-alignment that is, that is arising. So in that sense, it's quite like um, the 1900s. The, uh, the lesson from the 1950s, unlike the 1900s, must be we've got to avoid this, um, this contest, this competition drifting into confrontation and the catastrophic kind of war we saw um, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of, of the last century. And all the tensions of the 50s and the early 60s, um, the United States and the Soviet Union, when there was also a set of non-aligned powers, were able to manage their relationship in, in a way that avoided uh, competition uh, drifting into confrontation. And of course, by doubling down on our own strengths, our free market capitalism, our democratic system, in the end, we prevailed. And I'm confident we can do so again by following that parallel. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Tian. Yes, thank you. Hello, Washington. Thank you for having me from Paris. Uh, we have the state visit of uh, King Charles right now in Paris. And uh, uh, we are, I'm so happy to see uh, Mark on this occasion, but also HR and uh, old friends. Uh, as, as you have said, all of you, history is a guide for us. We must know history very well. And HR is a very good historian. And has said very wise things, but history never repeats itself. So to come to your question, from the 30s, we have also to learn that democracies must be strong and must not uh, compromise with uh, basic principles. I think this is something we have to keep on our mind. From the 1950s, we have to remember uh, how to manage the competition between big powers, the biggest powers as Mark has said. But there is something which is completely different from both the 1930s and 1950s, which is that we are not alone in the world. I think that Mark has said something like that. And he mentioned India, but it is not only India. We are in a world where um, now, and it was already the idea of the United Nations at the beginning, we must take into account the positions of everybody around the table, which means also Africa, and all the other actors. And this is really important. I think we will come back to this. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'm going to start now by going on each of the theaters so we can, we can have a conversation focused. Let's start with the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, General, we had you last year on the panel. Um, you and uh, Lord Sedwell and Ambassador Etienne worked when the Novichok poisoning happened uh, at the White House. What have you observed so far from the conflict? What has surprised you? What has not surprised you so far? Yeah. Well, I, I just think that what we, what the stakes are high here because you know this is not just a, a you know a, a individual uh, event in terms of the reinvasion of Ukraine in in uh, February of last year. It fits a pattern of aggression uh, from Russia under Putin that began really in the 2000s. You know, in the very beginning of the 2000s, 
I mean, you have to remember that you know, that uh, that Putin did poison a a, pre a Ukrainian presidential candidate in 2003 and permanently disfigured him. And the campaign of subversion was ongoing in Ukraine, uh, real, all, all the way up to the, the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the, the actual military invasion using a combination of conventional and unconventional forces, um, and then the, and then the reinvasion. But I think it's important to place the conflict in a broader context. And, and we're, we're here meeting at a moment when, when it seems that resolve to support Ukraine is at least wavering a bit uh, in Europe and, and in the United States. And so it's important to understand that the fight in Ukraine is relevant to being able to, to restore peace and to build a future of peace and prosperity by checking uh, an authoritarian revisionist power that brutally attacked Ukraine but also engaged in a range of aggressive action against Europe, the United States, in Africa, in Syria. I mean, what Putin has, has done, essentially, just in recent years, is effectively annexed Belarus. He's created all sorts of problems in other countries. Through political subversion, he turned the government in Georgia. He's active in Transnistria and Moldova. He's subverting with the future Bulgarian election right now. Uh, he's enabled the, the serial episodes of mass homicide. Uh, in the Syrian civil war and enabled the, the Iranians in, in, this, in his bid to, to play the role of both arsonist and firemen uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, and then, of course, we've seen that how active Russia has been to create more problems in, in West Africa as well. That, that's why this, this fight that the Ukrainians are fighting for, I think, all of us uh, in, in the free world is, is important to, to peace and, and security more broadly. And then you have to consider the other side. You know, Russia is is in this partnership with no limits, to use the word of Xi Jinping and Putin. And it's a partnership that's drawing others in as well. Iran with its uh, with its sale of of drones and soon to be missiles mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to to Russia. And you know, Kim Jong Un, the Shoigu visit to to uh, uh, to to Korea. Then of course Kim Jong Un's. Uh, visit to, to Moscow, the, the sale of arms probably in the, in the offering there. So I just think that this is a moment for all of us to recognize what is at stake. And again, the, the 1930s analogy can be way overdone. But I do think what we can learn from that period is a headliner, is that weakness is provocative. There's a lot of discussion about trying to avoid escalation, trying not to provoke Putin further. But what to provoke Putin in the first place whether it's the Skripal poisoning, which you, which you mentioned and others, is a perception of weakness. And I think that perception of weakness led to the reinvasion of Ukraine last year. And now is not the time to give Putin more hope. What he's hoping for is that we will lose our resolve. We, the, 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 the countries that have come together to support the, the extraordinarily courageous Ukrainians in, in the fight for all of us. Dr. Lulana. Yeah, so I'll, I'll build upon uh, what HR said. I think this is very, very important because there are lessons, I think, from, from Ukraine on various uh, uh, scopes. I think uh, we, sh we should also say that uh, there is a lesson about how this has evolved and our ability to, to understand uh, uh, that this is coming. I come from, from an intelligent organization. Uh, and I think we uh, uh, there is a cause to be praised to the American intelligence establishment of, of Realizing this on time and understanding that this is this was really coming, even in times where uh, uh, others, including the Ukrainians, uh, wanted the world to believe that this wasn't really uh, coming up, and that, that's an important message that this works. Uh, uh, I think also um, uh, that, that hard military force is still relevant, uh, something that HR has been talking in other panels on on as well. And I think there are two things uh, that relate uh, to that that we need to be cognizant of. First is the issue of time. I think one of the problems is that from the beginning of this war, all of the parties felt that time was on their side. Putin felt that, even though he miscalculated the way it started. I think the Ukrainians, at various points in time, uh, would rather com continue this because they want to, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, to finish it in the way they want. And I think that also the superpowers that are uh, uh, aiding this process, but a bit from the sidelines, uh, would rather see this uh, continue that way where, where Russia continues to weaken. It's been a year and a half already. This can last for so long. And as time progresses, I think the strategic calculus has changed. Also in other theaters that we will touch upon uh, later. The second thing I want to put out uh, is this issue of, of deterrence. And sir, I think this goes to what you said before about this perception of weakness. 
You know, when, before this war started, there were people in Russia, prominent people in Russia, referring to this as if this could, this was like a, a, a Cuban Missile Crisis all over again. Speaking of learning from history, right? From the American perspective, this wasn't anywhere close to the Cuban Missile Crisis because this wasn't personal. Americans didn't view this as something that they need to be engaged as part of a military collusion between uh, uh, the U.S. and Russia the way it was during the Cold War. So when Putin understood that he will not confront the superpowers, he can get away with it. Now, of course, he completely miscalculated the tactical pieces and couldn't conquer Ukraine the way he wanted. But I'm not sure he was wrong about the strategic message. He knew that he will go in, NATO wouldn't intervene, the Americans won't necessarily intervene, and he can go on. And I think there's a message there about how to, uh, what's the importance of posture, what's the importance of, of projecting power and being willing to fight for it when we want to, uh, uh, to deter an adversary. And we'll talk about China later, right? Naturally. I think this story will be relevant there as well. Lord Selva, over to you. Well, I agree with everything that's been said. So let me just add sort of really one point um, to all of that. I think particularly the point, uh, I agree particularly with the point that weakness is provocative. Uh, and I just want to, um, I just want to build on that point slightly. You know, the truth is that Putin over a long period, as HR has said, through incrementalism, it essentially got away with it. Uh, and I fear that had he gone for another incremental um, uh, extension of Russian activity in Ukraine, trying to seek a little more territory in the Donbass, trying just to create the land bridge to the Crimea, that essentially his, his forces are concentrated on since all of their setbacks um, in the first phase of this, then the Western reaction would not have been as forceful as it has been. Uh, and it was the fact that he went for a full-scale invasion to try and annex the whole of Ukraine, etc., cetera, um, that, that prompted um, the forceful Western reaction. And so we mustn't, we mustn't learn the wrong lessons from this. If, if you know, there are other uh, ambitious authoritarians around, the lesson they may well learn is, okay, don't go for broke, but incrementalism you can probably get away with. And therefore, we have to find a way as the Western Alliance and with allies um, and partners elsewhere who care about a rules-based order of deterring incremental aggression as well as all-out aggression. Thank you. Ambassador Bidia. Well, you asked about the lessons to learn from the current situation in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. First thing, as I said in my first answer and following HR and Mark, Yes, our democracies must be strong. And I would add to what was said, uh, I would remember what uh, we did in, or we did not do in 2013 in Syria. Uh, these signals are understood by uh, people like President Putin, of course. So this is the first thing to learn for the future. The second thing is to learn from the Ukrainian people themselves. Not only their courage, but also some issues with where they have been incredibly efficient. I think of uh, cyber, for instance, and their, their knowledge and their ability, their agility in uh, using or resisting or uh, defending themselves against cyber attacks. The third thing is for us Europeans, Europe sees war back to our continent. And we must not only expand our budget, our defense budgets, but also um, think that now the, the, the type of war we must prepare for are not exactly the wars that we were expecting. For instance, in France, we are more on expeditionary uh, missions uh, against terrorism. This has consequences not only for the amount of our budget, but also for the way our defense is, is organized. And if I may say, as a conclusion, the last thing we must conclude is that we must continue, HR mentioned the uh, hesitations which might appear in the support of Ukraine. And I think it's really important to continue to support the Ukraine. Uh, we will speak about the elections next, uh, next year in Europe and in the United States. It's really important because the fact of time is absolutely essential. The one who has the possibility to, 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 to create the one who is sure that he will sustain his support, his action 
over the years is really has a really big advantage. Thank you. Uh, let's switch to another theater. Uh, Dr. Lata, you mentioned uh, uh, China and Asia and Pacific. General McMaster, uh, China is watching what's happening in Ukraine. Um, next year uh, and 2025, 2030, as you said, is the maximum dangerous period for, I think, for the world. Uh, we argue the same in SESP. What are some of the lessons learned, do you think, China is taking from the Ukraine conflict? How will that translate to their thinking vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Uh, and then, you know, next year, as Ambassador Etienne mentioned, uh, most of the democratic world goes through the elections. Uh, and, and so there are a lot of uncertainties that are boiling uh, over the horizon. Uh, Chinese economic uncertainty, all these things making this decade really a decisive decade and a, and yeah. a dangerous one. Well, I think if you look at the threat from the Chinese Communist Party and, yeah. and uh, the degree to which China is challenging uh, you, you know, our, our interests, uh, it, it is it is a global threat. I think there is a tendency, and this is one of the, I think the false arguments about diminishing support for Ukraine is that we all should play like little kids soccer, you know, or European football, and all run to the ball in the, in the, in the Taiwan Strait, when in fact China is involved in competitions much more broadly than even the, the broad expanse of the, of the Indo-Pacific region. The competition is playing out in Europe, obviously, and China is watching to see what the lesson is. Will our will buckle? I mean, I think when we look back, Philippe mentioned the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014 being tied directly to the unenforced red line in Syria in 2013. I think the renewed invasion of Ukraine is tied directly to the disastrous self-defeat, surrender to a terrorist organization, and disastrous retreat from Afghanistan. Uh, it was it was in, in August of, of, of that year of 2021 uh, when he wrote the long missive justifying the attack and was marshalling his forces uh, to commit that attack uh, just just several months later. So this perception of weakness is provocative, not only to Putin, but also to Xi Jinping. And 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 if you look at the 2021 the invasion of Ukraine, think about what was going on in, going on in Europe as well in the United States. We had we had we had the denial of the of the election outcome here in the United States was driving even more political polarization. You had, you had Mark said, well, old boss getting in trouble for, you know, for the parties at number 10 <laughs> down the street. You had a very contentious election in France. You had a stoplight, what appeared to be a weak coalition in, in Germany. So I, 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 I think, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Israel was on its like 18th election. <laughs> and, uh, and then, so, so I, mean, I, I, think, I mean, I think there was this perception, you know, that, uh, the, you know, democracy is over. And I think it's really important to go back and read the joint statement that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin issued on the eve of the Beijing Olympics. You know what the message of that is? Hey, free world democratic countries, you're over. Yes. You're done. This is the new era of international relations and we're in charge. How's that working out for them? Not very well, I think. So what we should do is take the opportunity to maybe bolster our confidence to recognize that these authoritarian regimes can look strong from the outside. I mean, hell, they look great on parade, you know. But uh, but when you when you get to, when you get into a scrap in Ukraine, they don't look as as tough, and 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 uh, and they're actually quite brittle as regimes. So I really think if you look at what's going on right now in North Korea, in Iran, on the one year anniversary of Masa Amini's murder, uh, in 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 uh, in in, in uh, you know, in China, where, you know, they're having all these economic issues associated with what to me, you know, I'm just a washed up general, not an economist. But the whole thing looks like a big Ponzi scheme to me in China in terms of the Chinese economy. Uh, and, and obviously how, how Putin has succeeded in really diminishing Russia's power. So I think rather than be hand wringing the way we seem to be, we ought to be celebrating Ukrainian valor, bolstering our democracies, as, as Philippe has mentioned, as a critical to this competition and, and be more confident. Uh, in, in who we are, uh, in, in our friendships. You know, I mean, what cocktail party do you want to go to, man? I mean, do you want to go to the Xi Jinping hosted, you know, cocktail party with Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, you know, and the Supreme Leader? I don't think so, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dr. Hulada. Well, you know, after that, what can I say? Um, <laughs> would you but, go to that? Holiday but party? I will say... <laughs> I will say that, uh, 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 sir, I wish we had more of that uh, spirit in uh, world leadership of the democratic uh, power. 
um, and uh, thank you for your service at a time of difficult times. Uh, because I think that uh, this, this is, I, I completely agree, right? I mean, this should have been the opportunity of the liberal world to prove that uh, we're prevailing. And, you know, there's a quote I like to uh, uh, always uh, use. This is a crisis that, uh, and we shouldn't let it go to waste. But I'm not sure that we're taking this uh, uh, crisis and using it the way we want, you know, when we speak uh, uh, globally. Of course, I have my perspective on China, but nothing I can say that would, uh, that would top what uh, HR said. But a few perspectives from the Middle East. Uh, you know, we're, we're facing uh, uh, some difficult situations right now. 2023 was probably the best year Iran has experienced in many, many years. Yeah. And that's a shame because 2022 was one of the worst years Iran has faced in, I think, maybe since the revolution, right? And this has changed so fast because of what we do, because of how we act to it, because we deliver a message that there are things that they can go by with, because we legitimize 60% enrichment just so that they don't cross the threshold to 90%. I'm a little bit critical about the uh, uh, policy on Iran and that. And that resonates. Uh, and I think the Saudis also get some of those messages. It so happens that only after China come and broker a so-called deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, then the administration rushes in and try to say, okay, let's save this before China takes over the Middle East. Well, those things are happening continuously. We cannot only focus on one region on the wall thinking that if we only solve that in Southeast Asia, things will be okay. Because HR, as you said, the, the conflict with China is global. And the Middle East is one of those places where this is happening. This, this won't just be in a box. You know, people think, let's just go back to that deal or make that deal and things will calm down. This is not the reality. You know, from an Israeli perspective, we try our, our most to follow what Marcus said before and act on it when it's small before it gets too big. But those forces that we're facing are, are, uh, are extremely violent and extremely uh, against us, our, 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 our values, our cultures. That is very difficult. Thank you. Uh, Lord Sedwell. Thank you. I won't try and match um, HR's um, uh, uh, enthusiasm, um, uh, although I, I, I admire and agree with it. Um, uh, I think two or three lessons. I mean, thinking about what this would look like from Beijing. What lessons might they be drawing or should they be drawing from uh, Ukraine? The first is the point we've just heard, and I think we've all touched on really, that weakness is provocative um, and strength and patience is a deterrent. And um, Israel has always um, signaled and signaled um, uh, with credibility strength and determination in the defense of uh, Israel's territory and peoples and so on. And that's proved to be a very powerful deterrent for several decades now. And there's a lesson we can learn from that. That willingness, you know, as a relatively small country, but to protect their interests with absolute determination to ensure that their national security comes first, that they have the strength and the capabilities to do so, is really important. That's a, that's a powerful lesson for us. And so what lessons should they be drawing? Well, first, um, that um, once you start uh, a war, once you launch an invasion, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, and it can go very badly wrong. And we all know that amphibious operations of the scale and complexity that will be required in Taiwan are 10 times as hard as the kind of land-based operation in Ukraine. And China's forces have many of the same structural and uh, other weaknesses that the Russian forces have. And so I'd be very, very cautious. If I were the Chinese National Security Advisor, I'd be very cautious about uh, giving any confidence to my president that a military operation wouldn't end in actually an even bigger disaster than the uh, operation in Ukraine. Thank you. And as, uh, HR, but as HR has said earlier, no, no, go ahead. What is crucially important is we stay patient, we stay the course. Because if it looks as though we lose patience, we stop supporting the Ukrainians, we don't provide the weapons, the sanctions ease, and so on, then, um, of course, we're then encouraging aggressive action, whether that's a full-scale invasion or a blockade or something else. And so Western patience, Western strength is the most important deterrent here. Thank you. Ambassador Tian, uh, same question, but I would add a twist. Is this time for a strategic autonomy also to be introduced? Well, strategic autonomy for the Europeans is exactly about uh, having the, the instruments and the, politi the policies to be, to be strong, not to be weak. 
And for instance, uh, to be able to decide for our own interests. Um, and here I would extend it from defense to other strategic fields, such as energy, energy policy, energy uh, supplies, or technology, and our basic economic interests through just think of reciprocity when you when you when you have such such discussions with big big powers such as china so the strategic autonomy is very much for the europeans to get this and it is the lesson it is exactly the lesson which everybody here speaks talked about from what happened in ukraine we must be strong enough and we must have the instruments uh, to decide about our own uh, future uh, we have less than five minutes, so uh, a quick last question about artificial intelligence. Dr. Gulada, uh, you have a background uh, in this space. Um, SCSP is focused on you know, the impact of AI in ensuring national competitiveness. China has clear plans. They want to be a global AI power by 2030. How do you see AI fit in the current geopolitical environment? Yeah. So... Uh... I think this is true for AI. I think this is true for other emerging technologies such as uh, quantum computing and uh, uh, and the need to uh, to have the entire control over supply chains, uh, you know, uh, 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 chips, batteries, uh, uh, solar uh, technology. There are a host of things that our economies, that our, our cultural are are uh, are dependent on, so that we can uh, signify our strength. But I agree that AI is different of all of those because it can transform the world as we know it. This can make what we've learned uh, 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 as, as normal and common uh, uh, to change. Some of, of, the art, of the science fiction kind of uh, conspiracies and stories may emerge if, if we give those uh, abilities to computers and uh, to machines. I don't think this will happen so fast, but I think there is a trajectory there that can give our adversaries uh, uh, an advantage because they will be willing to do some of those things more faster than we would. Not necessarily on all of those. We need to remember that it was the Chinese in the 70s that joined the U.S. to ban um, uh, manipulation of genomes and uh, 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 just as, as forcefully. But I think that the power of the private sector now is much stronger and it's more difficult for companies uh, uh, um, to follow those, uh, those rules. I think, I think there's a lot to be done on this and I think there's a lot to be done of this together. I think this is time, as we said before, on military issues. I think this is also true in emerging technologies uh, uh, and commerce. We need to put our forces together because together we are stronger. And just a year ago, I think this panel was right at the kickoff of a joint strategic technology collaboration uh, uh, that was uh, uh, led by uh, Jake Sullivan, my interlocutor at the time, uh, uh, and myself on this, on this uh, stage. There's a lot that we can do together with the Americans, with the Europeans, um, um, on these issues because there are some risks and I'm not sure that we're moving fast enough to Thank contain you. them. Uh, Lord Sagal, I'm going to go to you next because uh, London uh, has been taking a leading role in sort of like organizing the international community. They're hosting the AI Safety Summit uh, early November. So your thoughts on the AI and its implication for geopolitical environment? Well, very briefly, it's a, it's a big topic, and I know we're short of time, so very briefly. I think on the, essentially on the civilian and commercial side, it's important that uh, we act in concert, particularly among countries with um, the same democratic values, in order to provide, essentially, that safe regulation of the use of all new technologies, um, but obviously including AI. I think we could do worse than starting with Asimov's three laws of robotics and sort of proceed from, with some of those principles. On the military side, however, um, we need to think very carefully about this. I think sometimes aspirationally people think there's a way of preventing the military development of AI. Um, uh, and actually what we need to recognize there is like any new capability, um, it, it can actually enhance our capabilities. It offers greater precision. We could minimize casualties on our side, minimize civilian casualties and, among our adversaries. And so we're bound to want to use autonomous tech and, and AI. Um, but defense and deterrence um, against, our, against the potential use of AI by our adversaries is going to be an important feature as well. And so um, we have to develop those capabilities while at the same time investing in the civilian capabilities that we're going to need to keep our economies competitive uh, over the next 25 years. Big topic, could do that answer in about two hours. 
that's the two minute version. Uh, thank you. And just a plug that we have the UK Deputy Prime Minister in about an hour here in person. So we'll follow up on, on, on the UK's role. Ambassador Etienne, last word on the AI implications for national security. Well, if I may say a word about artificial intelligence, Canada and France, when we had the presidency of G7 a couple of years ago, we, we have created with other G7 members the International Partnership of, at, on Artificial Intelligence, which is based on the OECD. And it's really important, uh, like Mark said, that uh, our democracies come to a common understanding on the environment on this, uh, of these developments. Um, so I will, uh, I will just, um, I will not develop this, but it's, it, it is now an absolutely s crucial aspect of our national security, but also an absolutely crucial aspect of our internal democracies. The development of artificial intelligence, as you can see, is really now the center of a lot of uh, discussions in our societies. And to, to make our societies stronger, we must also um, define the conditions to develop artificial intelligence in a way which is acceptable, for instance, in culture, for journalists, for uh, you see the discussions in Hollywood and so on. So on, on the national security aspects of AI, uh, I will not say more than what Mark has said because uh, it's very wise. Thank you. Uh, General McMaster, not many people know, but your national security strategy is probably the first one that mentioned the artificial intelligence. So last word from you. Hey, I'll, I'll just say that it, it would be wrong to hold back the development of artificial intelligence capabilities. Obviously, we want to integrate the ethical use of artificial intelligence into the way that we apply that technology. But you have to recognize that if you're going to constrain the development of technology, and if that technology gives a certain party a competitive advantage, all parties to that competition have got to sign up for the restrictions. And I don't think China Russia, others will sign up for it. So I think it's really important for us when we think about the big vulnerabilities uh, of artificial intelligence, like it could break all encryption. Well, how do we apply those technologies to make encryption stronger? If you're, if you're afraid, for example, that artificial intelligence could be used w along with biogenomics to develop biological weapons that target people with certain genetic codes, then hey, we better be applying artificial intelligence to be able to rapidly prototype and field vaccines, for example. So just think about the specific applications and the interaction of measures and countermeasures uh, across multiple disciplines. Thank you, sir. Before I uh, ask you to join me in a round of applause, I would just note the lunch will be served for the next 90 minutes. So please don't all leave because we have an amazing panel after this. We could not have a lunch break because so many uh, speakers that we invited wanted to accommodate our schedule and their schedule. So please be respectful. The program will continue. And please, uh, whenever you have time for your leg uh, stretch and everything, uh, uh, go outside. But thank me uh, for joining these gentlemen on this amazing panel uh, and being with us today. Thanks, Louis. Thanks a lot. Good to see you guys. Take care. Thank you.